So it's also a great pleasure um, to introduce the next speaker, Kai Kai Baron from UBC. Now the, the anecdote they have about Kai mm -hmm. is um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I was, a, I was a grad student in Grover Wheaton Theory, and uh, the reason Grover Wheaton Theory clicks at all in higher keynotes is because of this thing called the virtual fundamental clock, right? which is a monstrously technical thing, and as a grad student, I was, and, and Kai is one of the people that really contributed to building it, so as a grad student, I was studying his paper, and I was terrified about the paper, and, and of Kai, <laughs> because, you know, until all of a sudden there's, there's a conference, I don't remember the conference, but I have a very clear picture of a bar in which a group of us were sitting after some talks, and we all had a few drinks, and all of a sudden, like, I was not terrified anymore. <laughs> and so, and so my, my, my anecdote is really to say, like, one of the, the reasons that we're all here together is that sometimes, you know, we get to actually meet your your math god and you realize that um, you know we all human. So without further ado, Ed Baird is gonna tell us about Donald Trump and you and your concept for not. Okay, so thank you very much for um to the organizers for putting on this conference and giving me the opportunity to talk about this work. So it's joint work with two of my students, um Yishang Liu and Atsushi Kanazawa. Um there are some preprints there. And these slides are on my homepage, so if the slides go by too quickly, you can um, Google me and find um, on the talks page um, these slides here. So, um, okay. so first of all, um, can you see that? So I'm going to work over spec C and not over, I mean, everything would work over spec Q bar, but I would have to work a lot harder. So. Um, <laughs> Apologies. <clears throat> okay, so I start out with, um, okay, so the quantum projective force space. So this, um, so, uh, sorry? It's very difficult to read, wait, please, and then don't thank you. Okay, um, okay, <clears throat> actually, it is. Just well, okay, so here's um, the uh, so I start out with with like a um, like a um, like a quantum polynomial ring, let's call it. So there's um, there's five um, generators T0 through T4, and the little Q there means um, it stands for quantum, and so it just means that these these coordinates they don't actually commute with each other. But they commute up to some fifth roots of unity, and so I choose a fixed um, a fifth root of unity, a primitive one, and then all the others are just powers of that fixed one. And so all these commuting relations, I can summarize them by giving you this matrix. Um, but it only matters what the coefficients are modulo five. So by this skew symmetric matrix, but it's very similar to the commutative polynomial ring. It's just this slight. Um, twist when you have when you want to commute it's still generated by monomials um, over c for example <clears throat> so what is the quantum fermat quintic so it's just i introduce this uh i, I put I, I take this um fermat equation um so the sum um of the fifth powers of the coordinates um because um, the, the coordinates commute up to fifth um, roots of unity, this equation is actually central in my ring A, um, which means that if I mod out by, by just the left ideal, that's like modding out by the two-sided ideal, and I get a, an algebra. So that's the algebra Q for quantum Fermat quintic. <clears throat> and that's the object I'm interested in. And I, I want to think of it as um, a quintic hypersurface in this uh, quantum P4. And the goal in, in Donaldson Thomas theory is to count the number of coherent sheaves on such a thing. So, for example, fat points is, is the simplest case. So, <clears throat> but some of the geometry that you can associate to um, uh, such a 
non-commutative scheme. So there's, uh, we still have an abelian category of coherent sheaves. So that's usually denoted by QGER of the algebra Q of the graded algebra Q. So that's the finally generated graded left modules. Um, so just in the commutative case, if you have a projective scheme, the models over the homo modules over the homogeneous coordinate rings, graded modules define um, coherent sheaves if they're finally generated. Um, but if they <clears throat> differ in finitely many degrees, then they define the same coherent sheaf. So I can achieve that by modding out by this uh, subcategory of finitely finite dimensional graded left Q modules. Um, for, and the, the Q itself defines this, this structure sheaf in this category. And then I can define subschemes of my non commutative scheme, for example. Those then would be epimorphisms from this fixed object Q um, to others. And so the first theorem is that um, this uh, abelian category Q, GER Q, has global dimension three, which means that, first of all, all the X groups are finite dimensional. And uh, they all vanish. So xi vanishes if i is greater than equal to three. So <clears throat> that you should think of these two conditions as being uh, smooth of dimension three. So this non-commutative object is smooth of dimension three. Um, <clears throat> if um, this vector one, that's the column vector with all ones in it. If that's an eigenvector of this matrix n here, which it is, um, the way I've chosen these numbers. Um, then this is a Calabi-L3 category, which means I have this kind of duality statement between xi and x3 minus i. So the dual of x, this, the dual of xi is x3 minus i, where the arguments have been exchanged. Yep. So E and F are random elements um, of uh, random objects of Q or Q. <clears throat> so, so these are the kind of things you study in non-commutative geometry, but unhappily, we didn't get very far um, with techniques from non-commutative geometry um, using this description. So, <clears throat> but we did um, finally get somewhere um, by exploiting the fact that, that A has a very large center. So A is, um, remember the the quantum polynomial ring, the ambient guy. Um, <clears throat> okay, so it has a large center. So what I mean, so, so the fifth powers of the coordinates, right, those are central. So I call those fifth powers of the coordinates xi and make a polynomial ring out of the xi. And so that's embedded into my algebra A. So I call that B, right, B is embedded into A um, by this and so, and this A is actually finite rank over B. So it's finite rank over its center. This, um, so I'm little, so these are graded algebras, right? And so I want to use a grading where the X's have degree one. So which would force the TI's to have fractional degrees. So I pass to the sub algebra of A where all the, the degrees in the TI are divisible by five. So that doesn't, change anything. That's like a Veronese embedding. Um, so now I've, I've, so, so I've got this commutative polynomial ring, which, which, whose proj is P4. That's what I've written there. And this algebra over B defines the sheaf of algebras over P4. So this is this curly A. <clears throat> and it's not very hard to see at all what, what its um, structure is as a module. Um, over OP4 with a sheaf of modules. So just a bunch of twists. And you should notice this, this symmetry here. There's 121 copies of this and 121 of those. One copy of this, one copy of that. Anyway, so you could define a, like a pairing um, by, by, so I look at the multiplication in A, compose that with the projection onto this last um, factor here. And that is a perfect pairing because of that symmetry um, that I pointed out. And it's very easy to check, you know, that this pairing is symmetric uh, because this eigenvector condition there. 
Okay. Now, if I pass to the sub, um, right, the, now I'm going to introduce this equation, my Fermat Quintic equation. In terms of the x, it's just, just the linear equation, x0 through x4, the sum of the coordinates vanishes. So I have this hyperplane, x inside p4, which is isomorphic to p3, and I restrict the algebra A to the algebra Q over x. And so now I've got, um, so that sheaf of algebras Q over x is now my um, Fermat Quintic, the non commutative one. And so, important, the most important point here is that um, if I restrict this pairing to the hypersurface, um, <clears throat> then OX minus 4 is the uh, canonical um, of X, right? The canonical bundle of X. So, it's a perfect symmetric perfect pairing with, whose image is the canonical bundle of X. And so this is now, um, now I've got this um, in a more suitable format to do geometry with. So I make the following definition, a Calabi L3 pair um, is a pair. So where X is a usual smooth projective C scheme of dimension three, and Q is a locally free finite rank sheaf of OX algebras with a symmetric perfect pairing whose um, with, with image, um, the canonical bundle of X. So these are now the kind of things um, I, I can study, and this Fermat Quintic is a particular example of those. And of course, every commutative Calabria threefold is an example of such a pair. Just take the sheaf of algebra Q to be equal to the structure sheaf, and because of the structure sheaf being omega X on a Calabria on a Calabria three, this is an example of such a pair. And also this, this category that was a bit, bit unwieldy before, this q -ger, is now just the coherent sheaves of OX modules with an additional structure of a, of a Q module structure, less Q module structure. And so now I I'm, I'm, can use mostly commutative standard techniques to, to study this category moduli spaces of objects. And here's some more explanation about uh, yeah, where this reality comes from. Let me skip that. Mm. Okay, so now um, I've got the, this geometry set up. Um, what is Donaldson Thomas theory? So I want to spend just a brief amount of time on that. So, so we need modular spaces associated to these Calabio three pairs. I want to point out the modular spaces are all going to be commutative. Um, there's nothing non-commutative in the modular spaces. I use the commutative geometry to study the non-commutative objects. So first, there's two types. There's the Hilbert scheme and this, this co-scheme. So the Hilbert scheme is, um, so for every n, I'm just going to consider the Hilbert scheme of n points, which is easy to construct. It's just a closed subscheme of the quart scheme of Q. The Q is the sheaf of algebras, but I can think of it as a vector bundle on X, and so that has a quad scheme. Now just look at the closed subscheme of the quad scheme, which where the quotient, right, Q to F, so, so <clears throat> which which endows F with a structure of a Q module. So that just means equivalently that the kernel is a left ideal in Q, and the length of F should be n. So those are like so. This is a scheme of fat points on my quantum from our quintic. And for every um, polynomial, I, I define um, the modular space of coherent OX modules um, with Hilbert polynomial H uh, endowed with this Q module structure. So this is just objects in this abelian category I was talking about. I do need to <clears throat> introduce a notion of stability to get good modular spaces. And that's a whole subject unto itself. <clears throat> but it actually generalizes from the, to, to this case of pairs very easily by some work that Carl Simpson did in the 1990s. And so I will always assume everything's stable here. <clears throat> These two um, different kinds of modular spaces are connected via a morphism. So Hilp N to Co. So Hilp N is a quotient, and I just pass from the quotient to the kernel. 
but for getting the embedding of the kernel into Q. So this is now just a sheaf onto its own right. And in very good, in good cases, this is actually an isomorphism onto a union of connected components. So both closed and open. So <clears throat> the thing is that the DT theory is really about the co Q, um, but it can be used to study also the Hilbert scheme. <clears throat> and so the, the, so the subject of DT theory is we have to make sense of the virtual number of points. So that's just a count, a virtual count. Um, so I will get an integer, and then we want to compute these numbers. And so the key idea in Donaldson Thomas theory is that this co Q, this Mylar space of Clancy, behaves like a critical locus. So I want to discuss two things briefly here. So, one, what's so great about critical loci? Um, and then, why are, are Mylar spaces, why do they look like critical loci? So, first, um, Critical loci. So let's take a smooth scheme M and a regular function on it. So that's just a function with lies in C. And um, <clears throat> so the critical locus of, of this function is this fiber product. Um, so I, I have the cotangent bundle of M, the total space of omega M. I embed M via the zero section in there and also uh, via the df, the exterior derivative of f. Right? That is a section of the cotangent bundle. And I take uh, the scheme theoretic intersection of these two submanifolds. That's, um, so that's the definition of crit f. And if, if we assume that crit f is proper, which can happen, then um, intersection theory gives us um, an intersection number which is this I, that's the intersection number. It's well defined if, if the intersection is proper. And that's the virtual number of critical points of F. Right, you get a number because the two manifolds I'm intersecting are, are of complementary dimension. Um, so that's just standard intersection theory, but what's really special about the case of, uh, of critical points is the following. You can already see that if we look at the case of self-intersection, so F could be zero and then crit F, the DF would be zero. I'm doing the self-intersection of a zero section of M in some omega M. And then this virtual number is the top churn class of the normal bundle integrated over M, the normal bundle of omega M. Up to sign this, Right, omega m is a dual of tm, the tangent bundle, and um, the gauss bonnet formula says that this is equal to the topological or the characteristic of the manifold m. So um, that's a rather big deal that a um, this uh, intersection theory number is actually equal to a topological or the characteristic. But an even bigger deal is that this is completely general. Um, F, if F is completely arbitrary, as long as crit F is still proper, it can be singular. There's, there's a generalization of this gauss bonnet formula, which says that the virtual count is still in topological or that characteristic. Um, <clears throat> but now uh, I have to put in some weights. So every point, um, every critical point has a certain weight associated to it. And this topological or that characteristic, this weighted topological or that characteristic, is I, so I, I chop up my space into locally closed subschemes on which mu is constant. Oops. Um, compute the topological or that characteristic of each of the strata and multiply by the value of mu, the corresponding value for the stratum, and add everything up. And um, Here's the definition of this weight. So if I have a critical point, the weight associated to the point is this um, up to a sign and up to some trivial sum end. It's the topolo topological or that characteristic of the Milner fiber of F at P. So this is a brief um, <clears throat> definition of the Milner fiber. 
So here's a picture. So there's the manifold M. There's the function F mapping down to C. Uh, <clears throat> I have a point P and M. So it's a, it's a critical point. This means there's a singular point in the fiber through it. So that's the fiber through it. Um, and I take a small ball around P and intersect it with a nearby fiber. And so that little thing there, the intersection of the nearby fiber with a small ball, so that, that there is the Miller fiber. And like the homotopy type of, it's a little manifold with boundary. Um, <clears throat> it's homotopy type is a really interesting invariant, but all we're interested here is in the it's topological or characteristic. Okay, so um, <clears throat> so what so critical loci always have a virtual number of points associated to them if um, they're proper. By this singular Gauss Bonnet theorem, it is this this is it is equal to a topological Euler characteristic, a weighted one. In particular, I I can use this sorry this this as definition if critical crit f is not proper not compact okay so if it's compact i can use this also as a means of calculating um this so <clears throat> so that's what's the big deal about critical low site um, um, um the fact that that co q behaves like a critical lo locus is um well, that uses some uh, deformation theory, which um, maybe I'll just quickly say a few words. So <clears throat> if I have a point of the Marley space, right, that's a coherent sheaf, F. Its infinitesimal deformations are given by X1, F with itself. Um, there's an obstruction space called X2, and um, well, the point is that um, x2 ff is dual to x1 ff, um, which I guess I should. Well, <clears throat> I can actually, of course, embed any any scheme um, near a point analytically locally into its tangent space at that point. And it turns out that uh, for these modular spaces, um, so I, I can define a map from x1 to x2 such that its zero locus in x1 is a local analytic model of the modular space. And this um, was in general a very complicated map, but its lowest order term I, I've written down here as this, this Yoneda square thing. And just, I mean, right, it's just. Is not a proof because I'm only using the zeroth order, the lowest order term here. That map here is in fact a differential of a function which I've written down there. Um, so that map is so because the obstruction space here is a dual space of of the deformation space. I can think of this map as a differential. So the the modular space is the zero locus of a differential. The differential happens to be exact. Okay. So in general, of course, this code Q is not really globally a critical locus, but it carries what's known as a symmetric obstruction theory. Oops. Um, but it behaves like a critical locus. In particular, if my modular space is proper, I always have a um, virtual number of points, um, and in general, and, and this code Q has a constructible function on it, um, such that the virtual number of points is the topological or characteristic of of um, the modular space weighted by this function. So it's this, this new is a slight generalization of this Milner number I mentioned above. <clears throat> 
And so the definition of Donaldson Thomas invariance is just equal to this number. Right? And it's this dual nature of these two different types of numbers that make Donaldson Thomas theory so interesting. <clears throat> so in, in, in the compact case, right, I have this intersection theoretic number, um, <clears throat> which I can compute using <clears throat> topological Euler characteristic, chopping up the modular space because the topological Euler characteristic is additive. It also makes it possible to define these numbers even if the modular space is not compact. Okay, so I have some um, some some numbers here. So this is just the commutative case, so classical case where my sheaf of algebra Q is just the structure sheaf of OX. So it's just a classical Calabria threefold, and I'm interested in Hilt n of X. And I write down a generating function for these virtual numbers. So it's a gener z is my parameter, and so the coefficient of z to the n is this virtual number, this dt invariant. And I form, form this generating um, series, zeta. And here the theorem, this um, function is given by this formula here. So <clears throat> Sorry, M is this McMahon function, which is a generating function of 3D partitions. Um, anyway, it's written down there explicitly. There it is. Um, and I, basically up to the sign, I just take it to the power of the Euler characteristic of the manifold. And so, for example, the commutative quintic um, has the following uh, formula for this, you know, the, so the Euler characteristic of the commutative quintic is minus 200, and I get this explicit um, formula for this generating function. So for example, just the virtual number of points of X itself, so that would be Hilb 1, is minus the topological Euler characteristic, which is 200. So that's like one DT invariant. This was one of the first theorems proved in DT theory. Um, there's many proofs of it, but I, mean, I want to point out it's true also if X is not compact. Okay, so that's so much about um, the general theory. So now we have a theory of DT invariance for this. Also, we've generalized to the slightly non commutative case. And I want to do, um, well, we did some calculations about Hill N. And so if I'm looking at fat points, <clears throat> um, they're even, right, even as just OX modules, they, they will have finite uh, or yeah, zero dimensional support in X. Um, I can study them by looking at an affine open in X. So that's what I'm doing now. So I'm setting X not equal one. So one just um, set the zeroth variable to one and pass this open subset x naught of x. Restrict my sheaf of non-commutative algebras to here. Now it's in a sheaf of algebras, coherent locally free sheaf of algebras over affine three space. So it's just an algebra. <clears throat> and here's the structure of this algebra. So somehow the, the t's have turned into u's. Um, anyway. Right, I, I lost one variable, so now there's in five anymore. There's only four, and they still commute up to roots of unity. That fifth root of unity is determined by this matrix now. <clears throat> and um, right, the, the equation is now that the sum of the fifth powers of the UI is minus one. So now I'm, I'm saying we're, we're studying this algebra here. And we want its uh, one dimensional mod, uh, sorry, its n dimensional modules, which is the same as just looking at C algebra morphisms from this algebra into the matrix algebra. And so maybe I have time to compute um, some of these numbers. So I start with n equals one. <clears throat> n equals one. So that means I've got these four variables, u1, u2, u3, u4, and uh, this homomorphism, so they, they turn into numbers under this map 
to M11, C. In the algebra MQ, they don't commute, but of course, if I map them to numbers, they will have to commute. And the only way to resolve that contradiction is by saying they, they're all zero, except for at most one of them. So U1 can be non-zero and the other three can be zero. But because of the equation, um, U1 to the five has to be equal to minus one. So U1 has to be um, negative fifth root of unity. So there are five of them corresponding to five one-dimensional representations as zero through as four. And if I look at where they're supported over X, they're all supported over this point one minus one zero 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 and so u2 u3 u4 being zero corresponds to x2 x3 x4 being zero x0 was one and x1 is u1 to the fifth right that's x1 so those are all there's five of these um one-dimensional modules over this point in x but there's there's um 10 such points in x where two variables are non-zero and the other three are zero. There's 10 such points. Each of them has five of these um, simple modules above it. I'm giving a total of 50 points. So <clears throat> that's, um, in fact, this is a, not just a virtual number, an actual number um, for HILB one of Q. But as soon as I go to HILB two, uh, there's gonna, it's not just a discrete set of points anymore and I have to go virtual. Okay, um, so here, uh, this is, uh, sorry, I'm gonna have to go a bit fast here. There, there's, I've written down some two-dimensional representations which are extensions of these one-dimensional uh, by each other. And so there's 15 of them all together and I put them all into a diagram like this. So there's the five vertices correspond to my five um, uh, one-dimensional modules. The 15 arrows correspond to these two-dimensional representations, um, two-dimensional representations that are extensions of these one-dimensional by each other. And if an arrow goes from one vertex to another, it means that I have an extension of this guy by that guy and so on. So I can encode all these zero and one-dimensional representations in this quiver, which the quiver is a, um, directed graph. Um, <clears throat> the quiver encodes in algebra, it's path algebra, where the vector the basis is the path of length greater than or equal to zero and multiplication is concatenation. And somehow, I mean, I'm waving my hands a bit here, but this, um, this affine piece of my mm, quantum from our quintic um, maps to this path algebra via so these two variables u2, u3, u4 going to the sums of the ai which are the green ones the sum of the bi which are the purple ones and some of the ci which are the red ones so <clears throat> yeah long story short um, the surprise here's the surprise that actually so my, my algebra q turns out to be isomorphic to this path algebra of the quiver if I mod out the path algebra is by some relations. There is, I've written down um, the isomorphism. Um, it requires me to um, extract the fifth root of X1, but X1 is non-zero, so I can do that in the neighborhood of my um, special point. And so I can see that my um, non-commutative algebra and my quiver algebra are at least analytically locally isomorphic near this point. And so everything that happens um, for Q naught over this point, I can describe in terms of this um, quiver with relations. And then it turns out that um, the relations all come from a potential. I can write down this fancy um, linear combination of cycles in the path algebra and the 15 derivatives give the 15 relations. I'm sorry, I'm going a bit fast here. <clears throat> Moduli spaces of representations with quiver are also critical loci. Anyway, but, but somehow one has the 
idea that if you have a quiver with potential and its representation, that's a more combinatorial problem that you might be able to solve. Unfortunately, we're not there yet, but um, we do we are able to conclude that this that this generating function um, for this quantum Fermat quintic of the virtual numbers of the Hilbert schemes is so here's the um, corresponding generating function for the quiver with potential to the tenth power that corresponds to the ten points I have the ten special points and then there's a McMahon function which corresponds to the rest of everything that happens outside my ten special points which turns out to be just like the commutative case. So we got like a mixture here between uh, something that looks like the commutative classical case and, and quiver representations. So maybe um, I'll have to stop here. Uh, thank you.